Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the power of outside options. That's the topic of Chapter 5 in Game Theory 101 Bargaining. You can check the video description for more information on that. This lecture actually represents a break in the course. Previously, we've been focusing on proposal power. We started off with an ultimatum game, then we had a single counteroffer, then we had multiple counteroffers, and then we finally built up to that Rubenstein game where there's an infinite horizon and infinitely many potential counteroffers. Now, these models were great because it allowed us to analyze how proposal power matters, but it came at a significant downside. Those models grew very complicated very quickly. And now that we're no longer interested in understanding why proposal power is a form of bargaining power, we're interested in other sources of bargaining power going forward in this course, we don't actually need these really complicated models to understand these other forms of bargaining power. And so as a result, from here forward, we're going to be focusing on models that are like the ultimatum game, this simple take-it-or-leave-it offer that Albert will propose to Barbara. Now, the reason that we can do this is that we could find similar sources of bargaining power in one of these very complicated Infinite Horizon models, but rather than spending a lot of time doing these analytically demanding games, we could find similar results in a much shorter period of time by opting to look at an ultimatum game instead. And so that's why we're going to be focusing on the ultimatum game and using that to analyze various other sources of bargaining power that are not just proposal power. So going back to the ultimatum game, we've seen this before, Albert makes a take it or leave it offer X to Barbara, which Barbara accepts or rejects. If she accepts, then she receives a value of X, the offer, and Albert receives the remainder. And if she rejects, then both parties receive zero. We could think of an alternative situation, though, where if Barbara rejects, she doesn't simply receive a payoff of zero. This could be a wage negotiation between Albert and Barbara. Albert is the boss, Barbara is the employee. And Barbara, if she rejects an offer from Albert, she doesn't receive nothing. She goes to a different company and gets hired at a different wage that's not just zero. Or they might be at a flea market and Albert is trying to sell Barbara an article of clothing. Or they might be at a farmer's market and they're bargaining over strawberries or what have you. In these sorts of situations, though, Barbara, if she rejects, has an alternative. She can go somewhere else and try to get an offer from there that's going to give her some particular value that's not just zero. So rather than thinking about a game where if Barbara rejects, she, receive a, she, uh, rather she receives a payoff of zero, we could think about a situation where if she rejects, she receives a payoff of Y instead. Now, we're going to be focusing on the situation where y is a value between 0 and 1. If the value is less than 0, then that's saying that Barbara is actually worse off if she rejects, so that's actually not a situation that we care about too much. And if the value is greater than 1, then there's no reason for Barbara to be negotiating with Albert. Barbara would be better off going elsewhere. So we're going to focus on the situation where y is between 0 and 1, and if we analyze this game, if we solve this game just as we did for the standard ultimatum game where y was equal to zero, the solution is straightforward. Barbara accepts any offer at least equal to y, if not greater. And so Albert is going to offer Barbara y and Barbara will accept. So think about what's going on here. If Barbara rejects, she receives a payoff of y which means that she's not going to be accepting anything less than that. She has to receive at least Y to find that deal acceptable. And so Albert, anticipating this, knows that if he wants to have bargaining succeed, which is good for him because it allows him to get a positive payoff rather than getting a payoff of zero, he needs to make Barbara the minimally acceptable offer, which is equal to Y. So this is a very simple game with a very simple takeaway, which is probably intuitive to most people which is that the better an outside option you have, the better a deal you have. That outside option here is defined as whatever the best alternative is to bargaining, where in this case, the best alternative to bargaining with Albert for Barbara was to accept this value from a uh, value of Y from somewhere else. So again, the better your outside option is, the better deal you can get through bargaining. Just increasing Y means you have an increased offer of Y that Albert is going to give to Barbara. 
right? If we go back to this slide, Albert is offering Barbara Y. So the larger Y is, the bigger you improve her outside option, the more Albert is going to give to Barbara. So this should strike most people as being intuitive, and yet oddly, a lot of people, when they're negotiating on their own, don't actually utilize this principle, this property of power of outside options, properly. Why not? Well, here are some examples. Uh, you might imagine that you're working at a current job and you receive an outside offer from a different firm saying, hey, come work for us at this wage. A lot of people will just immediately leave their current job and go elsewhere rather than saying, hey, boss, look, I got this outside offer from this other company. How about you give me a little bit more and then I'll think about staying. We also see, uh, excuse me, we also see this when people are negotiating over a car, when one person will go to a single dealership and try to negotiate the value of a vehicle rather than visiting multiple dealerships and trying to leverage the fact that she has an outside option at a different dealership with her negotiating at the current dealership. And lastly, a lot of us in the United States especially have to have car insurance if we're driving when we're trying to buy car insurance from a particular company, we don't tend that often to call around, even though we should, and see what different prices we can get from different companies and use that to leverage other companies to lower uh, your driver's insurance. So, you know, maybe particularly if my car insurance is coming from Allstate and I call up Geico and Geico says, hey, here's my price, why don't you switch to me? Uh, then why don't I call back my current company and say, hey, I have this alternative at all, or rather at Geico, so hey, Allstate, if you want to keep me with you, you should give me a better deal. These are the, the power, these are examples where outside options would provide some sort of bargaining power, and yet very frequently we see people ignore this fact, even though the intuition behind outside options being good for you in bargaining is so apparent. I mean, really at the, the bottom here, at the very fundamental core, what this first bullet point says, better outside options lead to better deals, that's basically saying good things are good. And yet, despite the fact that everyone knows that good things are good, people don't actually all the time use this to their maximal advantage. And this is something that I'll talk a little bit more about when I spin off this course, when I start looking at applied bargaining theory in a related course. So look for that later on. Uh, until then, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.